Are you ready to hear God's word? Yes. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, open to Mark chapter 8. And on your bulletin, it's how it says Mark chapter 9, but we're still in 8. That was my mistake. I moved a little bit ahead. But it's Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Uh, if you're new here, we like to go through the books of the Bible, and verse by verse, and we've been at, in this book for several months, and so we are in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 38. Uh, one of the questions that I get, get periodically every once in a while is, Pastor Sam, what is your heart for Jubilee? What is your desire? What is your heart for Jubilee? And this is a great question, and at the heart of it is, what's your vision? Or what is the vision of this church, where we are going? And I could share a lot of different things, and when people ask me, but one of the main things that I share, and that is the heartbeat of our church, and that's my heartbeat, and hopefully it's yours, is that we want to be a church that makes disciples. Okay? We want to be a church that makes disciples of Jesus. We want, our mission is that people would come here and they would encounter Jesus. So that is not just our vision, you know, just the vision of our church, or my vision, that's our vision. And we want more and more people to come to know Jesus. We want more and more people who are not disciples of Christ to come and be, become a disciple. But that, it doesn't end there. It's not just, hey, we want people to become a disciple of Jesus, that's great, now you're a disciple. We not only want people to encounter God, but my brother says, so once you encounter God, we want people to grow. When you encounter God, you cannot remain the same. Amen? It's growing to be disciples. So we want not only more and more people becoming disciples of Christ, and if you're not a Christian here, that's our heart for you. But if you are, if you are a Christian, we want you to grow and to be changed by the transforming power of the gospel. To be disciples, to be genuine disciples. Not to be a nominal Christian. There is nothing like nominal Christian. To be a Christian means to be a disciple of Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen? Like we talked about before, there's no different categories of Christians. To be a Christian means to be a disciple of Jesus. Now you may ask, what does that look like? What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? And my brothers and sisters, we hear today, straight from the mouth of Jesus, what does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus? We don't have to hear from somebody else. Jesus himself tells, what does it mean to follow him? Now, this passage does not, does not give us everything about discipleship. Jesus doesn't say everything that it means, but it gives us few things that are important and main words, main things. And let me warn you, these are hard words. This may be very different from what you think being a disciple of Christ looks like. But my prayer is, my brothers and sisters, that we will all respond to the word of God. We will respond because this is the words of, these are the words of Jesus. This is God's word. And that's why we like to teach straight from the scripture, not our own opinions or thoughts. Because that's what Jesus' words have authority. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, this is a good Sunday to be in church because you know, hey, what does it mean to be a Christian? But if you are a Christian, my prayer is that we will ask ourselves this question. Am I really living as a disciple of Christ? Am I really following Jesus? Or am I just, just I'm so happy that, you know, I'm just a Christian, but that's it. Am I really living the vision and dream that Jesus have, has for my life. Right. So turn to Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. We'll see how it all begins. Verse 27, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. So Jesus asked his disciples, and as you will see in a little bit, this is just the, the setup for the next question, which is the most important question that you can ever answer, or a question that you can ever be asked. Jesus says, who do, you people, who do people say, when you're on the street, what do people say about me? They say some people think, hey, you are a, re a reincarnation of John the Baptist. You may, you're Elijah. 
Are you one of the great prophets who has come back? What's common in among all these men is they were great people who served as a spokesman for God. They spoke for God. They were pointing towards God. So they say, hey, these, we think, people think very highly of you. They think that you're like Elijah. You think one of the great prophets. You were spokesman when you were pointer to God. My brother said the predominant answer that people got in Jesus' day, it's pretty common even in our times. Many people, if you ask, hey, who is Jesus? They say, hey, he was a wonderful man. He was a great man. He was a great teacher. He had a lot of wisdom. He showed people how to be sacrificial and loving. He was a very fascinating man. If you ask a Muslim, they'll say he was a great prophet. He was a wonderful prophet. He was a good prophet, good, taught a lot of good things. Now, you may say these are all nice things and even in some ways true about what, who Jesus is. But this is very incomplete. For example, if I ask you who is Donald Trump, and you may say, well, he's a business, successful businessman from New York. Now, that's right. Okay, that's true, and that's something nice to say about him. But at some point, you have to say, hey, he's the president of the United States. So you may say, people, a lot of people have facts about Jesus, which are true, but that's not his main identity. And so Jesus gets to his disciples and said, okay, now, I don't care about what other people see as much, but I want you to know what you say about me. Who do you think I am? And as you can see last several weeks, Jesus has been revealing his identity to his disciples. Now at this point, as we saw last week, their eyes are not completely open. They're still blind in many ways. We saw that especially last week. Over and over again, Jesus has been revealing himself, but they don't. They're, they're like that blind man who saw the first time, but he saw what? Men like trees. Okay? And their eyes are not completely open. So in verse 49, he asked him, but who do you say that I am? And in Greek, you is first. You. Forget about other people. But you, what do you say? Who do you say that I am? And my brothers and sisters, this is the most important question you can ever be asked. There's no question that is more important. Your whole eternity hangs in balance and how do you answer this question? Who do you think Jesus is? Who do you think Jesus is? This is the, the answer to this question. How do you answer sets you on a track that is eternal? It's not just, hey, I think, you know, whatever. It has eternal consequences. And notice how Peter answers this. He says what? You are what? The Christ. You are the Christ. First time in the whole Gospel of Mark, this is right in the middle of the Mark, this is the first time somebody confesses Jesus as Christ. So this is a watershed moment in the book of Mark, in the Gospel. Jesus, God has opened the eyes of Peter and the other disciples, and he said, you know what? We've seen what you've done. We've seen your glory. We've seen the miracles. We've seen your teaching. And Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the promised Messiah that all the Old Testament prophets pointed to. You are the Redeemer sent by God. My brothers and sisters, this is where discipleship begins. You say, how do I begin my relationship with Christ? This is where you start. You start by recognizing who Jesus is. You start by recognizing what Jesus has done on your behalf. And you start by making this decision to follow him. That you are the Christ. You are the Lord. You are who you say you are. And that response, when you respond to Christ, this invitation of Christ, you believe who Jesus is, what he has done on the cross. And you surrender, as you will see next, you surrender your life to him. That's what it begins, means to become a Christian. Now we'll see, soon see 
that Peter gets the identity of Jesus right, that he is Messiah, he is Christ, but still, he's like, he sees, but he still sees like men walking like trees. His eyes are not completely, and it will not be, as we saw last week, their eyes will not be completely open till they see Jesus die on the cross and is resurrected. So that's why Jesus says in the next verse, verse 30, and he strictly charged them not to tell charge them to tell no one about him. Because they are not ready, as we will see. They, have to, they know who Jesus is. They, he gets the answer right. But it's a very incomplete answer. It's not just incomplete, it's actually total misunderstanding of who Jesus was. So Jesus begins to tease them as to what kind of Messiah he is. Because they have, as we will see, they have an understanding of what Messiah should look like. Remember we talked about last week. Some of us reject God some of us reject Jesus because we have a preconceived idea of what God should look like. Right? God should be like this. God should be like this. God should be like that. And when God does not fit our criteria, we reject him. So they have a preconceived notion about who Messiah is. And they recognize that he's the Messiah. But Jesus began to teach them of what Messiah would look like or what kind of Messiah he is. Verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now Jesus here predicts his death and resurrection in the next three chapters used in three times. Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. He says the Son of Man, that's the title of Jesus, all goes all the way to uh, Daniel chapter 7. He said, the Son of Man, the God incarnate, must suffer, and he must be rejected, and he must be killed. But he'll rise up on the third day. Why does he say he must? Some of you may have a question. My kids before used to ask me, said, why did Jesus have to die? Could you just God just forgiven everybody's sins and why all this mess? Of Jesus being crucified, why does he, why must he suffer? And he must be rejected and must die. The word must is important. Because my brothers and sisters, this is the only way we simple people, simple humanity can be reconciled to God. It's all the only way we could be reconciled to God is God himself, the perfect Lamb of God. Jesus would come and he would die, take our place on the cross, the penalty that we deserve, the wrath of God that we deserve for our sins, Jesus took upon himself. And he died, he took our place on the cross. We could never ever pay for all eternity, we could never pay the debt of our sins, we could never be forgiven. God's justice requires, God's justice requires that sin be punished. You, we know that, right? If somebody kills somebody and the judge says, hey, you're free to go, you'll be angry. If something, somebody did a terrible thing and the judge gives that one month prison time, <laughs> this is injustice. We don't go, hey, why don't the judge just let him go? Because that's built in us. There's a justice system. And in God's justice, sin must be punished. And the only way, the only way who can take our debt was Jesus. So Jesus was not a victim. He was not like came and then he put something and people killed him. This was the very plan of God to save us, to reconcile us to God. So Jesus is protecting his own death, his own suffering, his own rejection that we can see and we will see. But also that he will rise on the third day. And for those of you who were here if I, during the Lent season, when we went through the last three chapters of the Mark, of the Gospel of Mark, you saw how everything came exactly as Jesus said. He did, he did suffer for our sake. We talked about that. He did die, he was, he was buried, but on the third day, he rose from the dead. 
So we saw the exact fulfillment of what Jesus is predicting here. But Peter, when he heard, because he had a very different understanding of what, what Messiah should be, he had his own preconceived ideas of what Messiah should be. That when he heard that Jesus would be rejected, that the man he just confessed as Christ, the Messiah, will be rejected, will suffer, and will die on the cross. When Jesus says that, he's shocked and he's upset. Verse 32 says, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. When Jesus said, Peter, you got it right. But I'm the Messiah who will be rejected, who will suffer, and who will die. And Peter goes, Jesus, stop all that negative talk. Stop saying all this negative thing that you will die and you will be rejected and you, you will go on the cross. Because you are the Messiah. You are sent from God. And you know why? Peter is so shocked and upset and is rebuking Jesus. Because Peter and the other disciples, along with all, every other Jewish person, the understanding of Messiah they had was this Messiah will come and will kill and destroy and conquer and defeat their Roman oppressors. This is the understanding. They were looking for a political figure who would come and destroy Rome and restore the Jewish pride and bring it back to a place of prominence that was during David's time. So that's what they're understanding. So Peter is going, yes, Jesus, I know you are the Messiah, but here's my understanding of what Messiah is. We want political freedom. We want you to kick out these people who oppress us and give us that freedom. My brothers and sisters, if you're honest, many of us have a similar understanding of Jesus. For us, it's not, as we'll see, not following Jesus so that we will fulfill God's dream, God's mission, God's agenda. But we go, hey, this is what I want. These are my dreams. These are my vision for my life. This is my agenda. And God, I'll follow you. And I want you to do, fulfill my dreams, my agenda, and give me the things that I desire. If you're honest, many of us are there. That's our understanding of what it means to follow God. Yes, I will follow Jesus. I'll come to church. I will give. I will serve. But Jesus, we want you to do what I want you to do. And that's why, my brothers and sisters, many of us are disappointed with God. We are disappointed when God doesn't give us our ambitions. When God doesn't give us our desires. Because following God is all about us. Verse 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus calls Peter a Satan. Peter Satan. He said, get behind me, Satan. Why? He said something nice. He's like, Jesus, I don't want you to die. You're the Messiah. You're the powerful one. You're the anointed one. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. What is going on here? Why does Jesus say, get behind me, Satan? Because Peter at this point, although seems very nice, is actually inspired by Satan. You know why? Because Satan never wanted Jesus to go to the cross. Satan would do anything, would have done anything. And even you saw, I mean, you would see with the Gospels about the temptation. He was trying to keep everything he can do to keep Jesus from going to the cross. And here, he's even using Peter to hinder him from doing the very purpose of his life. If you think that Satan had Jesus crucified on the cross? You're wrong. Satan did not want Jesus to be crucified. Satan, because Satan knew what will happen if Jesus is crucified on the cross, that will lead to his defeat. Because on the cross, Jesus crushed Satan. And here, he's using Peter. A man who just confessed Jesus as Lord to hinder for the very reason 
that Jesus came into this world. Jesus then turns to his disciples and to the whole crowd there and tells them what it looks like to follow him. Because although he's confessed, his disciples have confessed Jesus as Lord, they have been following him, they have, a, they have seen the miracles, but they still have a very different idea of what it means to follow Jesus, like many of us. As I said, Jesus is all about God giving my dreams, my vision, giving me what I desire. And so Jesus begins to teach them. You have a wrong understanding of what it means to be my disciple. Let me tell you, what does it look like to be my follower, to be my disciple, what it looks like to be a Christian? Verse 34, and calling the crowd to him and his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me. The word anyone is important. You know why? Because again, there's no different categories. Because we, when you hear stuff like this, what Jesus is going to teach us, and these are hard, the first thing is like, yeah, 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 but you know, I'm not that. I'm, these are for super Christians. Or these are for a different level of Christians. But I'm just an ordinary Christian. My brother said, what does Jesus say? If who? Anyone. He's not talking about a special category of Christians. He says, if anyone would follow, if, there's, if you call, if you are a follower of Christ, if you take my name, you are in this category. And this applies to you. If anyone would come after me, he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus was not a very seeker-friendly gospel preacher, was he? He said, you want to follow me? Deny yourself. Renounce yourself. You will lose your freedom. And you will take up your cross. And your cross for us, we have a Roman, romanticized idea of what cross is, right? We put it. But think about the first century people. As they walk on the street, they see people dying this shameful death on the cross. <laughs> Nobody put a cross on their, uh, you know, on their neck back in the day. It was a shameful, humiliating thing. They saw. Because we don't see people killed on the cross, we don't fully understand this. But look at them. They, as they go on the street in the marketplace, Jesus was not the only one who was crucified. They saw this was a common place. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. If you follow me, there will be suffering. Your life may not be easy, or will not be easy, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. What does that mean, my brothers and sisters? And as I said, this is for each and every one of us. If you're a Christian, this is for you. It means to renounce your life. When you come and become a follower of Christ, it means that you lose authority over your own life. You lose the right to your own life. You lose the authority to your own life. You're no longer the Lord of your life. Who is the Lord of your life, my brothers and sisters? Jesus. You no longer own you. You're owned by God because you've been, you've been bought, the Bible says, with the precious blood of Christ. To deny yourself and to follow Jesus means that when your desires, when your ambitions you don't live your life for your desires, your ambitions, and your agenda. You lay that at the feet of Jesus, and you pick up God's dream, God's agenda, and God's desire for your life. It's not living our life for ourselves. What pleases me? What is good for me? What will bring me the greatest happiness? It means you surrender your life to Christ. When your desires, your ambitions, your preferred future for your own life. We have that, right? We have a preferred future. Hey, this is what I want with my life. What is different from what God has for you is to lay that before God and say, God, what matters is not my dreams, my desires, my agenda for my life. But because you own me, 
You are my master. I yield my life to you, my future to you, my desires, my ambitions, every part of me. It means laying your dreams down and laying your agendas down. Now, this doesn't mean following Jesus. Yeah, it means to all your deep dreams die. It doesn't mean that. Because my brothers and sisters, as you follow Christ, as you walk with Christ, as you delight in Christ, God will give you great kingdom dreams. God will put dreams in you and birth because God wants us to be dreamers. But it's not dreamers how to make our life great, but how to make the kingdom of God great. So I'm not saying there's dreams that God's put in, it's from God. God will give you, when you surrender your life to God, and when you come before God and say, Lord, it's not about, life is not about me, life is about you. My job is not about me, my job is about you. My children are not about me, my, ch my, my children are about you. My money is not about me, my body is not about me, it's about you. When we come with that kind of heart to surrender before God, God gives us dream, God gives us an agenda. And my brothers and sisters, God is a better dreamer for your life than you are for yourself. I can assure you that. Because we have dreams, but our dreams are so small compared to what God has for us. Our dreams are so self-centered. You can achieve your dreams, but at the end of your life, you'll, be, you'll regret that you followed your dreams. If you're a Christian and you follow your own dreams apart from God, your own ambition, your own desire, you can have all those things. And you will live unfulfilled life and you will regret. God will give you dreams. And those dreams, you'll be happy that you follow God. It also means to deny and to take our cross it means to crucify, deny and crucify your sinful nature. We all have that in us, right? This struggle within us is the Galatians 5 struggle. You have the Spirit of God as a believer, give, has given you new desires, has given you new nature, but the Bible also says we have the old self within us, right? Do you see that sometimes in your own life? And it comes up, you have this new desires, God-given desires, that desires to follow God, but you also have this fleshly desire that pulls you in the other direction. When you are at work at home and somebody humiliates you or hurts you, what is your fleshly desire? None of you know what that looks like. What is your fleshly desire? At that point, you want to lash back. You want to get revenge. You want to, you, you humiliated me, I will humiliate you. And we have this fleshly tendency to hold on to unforgiveness. You did this for me, you will pay for it. But then you have that, but on the other hand, the Spirit of God is convicting you through His Word, in your spirit. You are my child. I have forgiven you. You represent me among your friends, among your family. I don't want you to hold on to your anger. I don't want you to give back the way what they have done to you. I've been generous to you. I've been gracious to you. I have forgiven you. When you were a sinner, I want you to do that. So you see that struggle in your own heart. And my brothers and what it means at that point to deny yourself is you go against your desire and you side with Jesus. That is denying. It's to kill your ego at that point. It's to kill that sin, old nature rearing within you, and say, God, with your spirit, help me to put this to death right now. That's what it means. Husbands, fathers, when you come home after a long day of work, and you're tired and exhausted, and you walk into your home, and first thing you think, what? I need some me time, right? I deserve this, I worked hard. But there's your wife and your kids, Lunging after you, or at least your children. And your wife needs a break. And everything is like, man, I work hard today. This is my time. How many feel that? During those days, the Spirit of God says, this is not your me time, this is time.
strength for you to give yourself away. And during those times, what do you do, my brothers and sisters? You put your self-centered to death. And say, God, this is what you're calling to. This is my calling. I will put. I will go and obey. And I can go on and on and on in different areas of your life. We are, my brothers and sisters, by nature, self-centered. We care about ourselves, what's good for me, my family, and my life, what brings me greater joy. But the more you grow in Christ, the Spirit of God puts this new, new desires in your heart, a new nature. But you feel the struggle every day. And God wants to break that selfishness. And my brother says, the wonderful thing is, it's not that God said, just do it on your own. He has put His Spirit within us. But we need to listen to the Spirit of God. We need to obey the Word of God. What it means to follow Jesus is to follow His Word. You can't say, oh, you know, I love Jesus, but I don't care about His Word, about following His Word. It's like saying, hey, I really love my wife or really husband, but I don't care what he or she says. To love a person is to love with their Word, right? I mean, someone won't be very happy if I say, hey, I really love you, but I don't care what you say. She goes, oh, why my husband loves me? I, at least you love me. But just don't talk. <laughs> I don't care what he said. That's not love. To follow Jesus, my brothers and sisters, is to follow his word, is to obey his word, is to honor his word, is to desire his word. And it's very interesting, he says, follow me. He doesn't say, hey, just, he doesn't say, hey, walk with me. Word. But it's follow. Follow means like, you put your dreams, your agenda, your everything behind Jesus. You follow Jesus. And Jesus is taking you through a, a place where it's different. He said, God, you're a better dreamer than I am. My brothers and sisters, this also involves suffering, as I said. If you follow Jesus, you will be mocked. You will be mocked. You will be persecuted. You may not face some of the persecution that people in other countries face, but you will face persecution. You may miss that promotion. You may lose a lot of your stories. Would be when you became a Christian, you lost many of your good friends. I've had people tell me that they lost all their friends because they could not relate. That's like you became a Jesus follower. You became one of those Jesus freaks. We want nothing to do with you, and you feel alone, or you felt alone. You will feel shamed. People will shame you. My brothers and sisters, if you follow Christ, it will come at a cost. Salvation is free. But when you follow Christ in a fallen world, you will not be celebrated. You will not be honored. And some of us, don't want to follow Christ because you know this is what it means. You avoid God's command because you know in your heart what it means to follow Christ. And this is so countercultural, right? This is so different from what our culture teaches us. And my brother says the reason we need to be discipled, the reason it's important that we are here learning God's word and being discipled in our small groups in other ways. Is because we are not the only ones trying to disciple you. You know who else is trying to disciple you? Can you guess? Our culture. Our culture is constantly trying to disciple us. And they're very committed to it. The reason it's important that we disciple our children, because if you don't disciple our children, guess who is doing and is committed to discipling your children? It's our culture. And my brothers and sisters, God's way of doing things, of parenting, of living our life, is very different from culture. Culture will tell you, hey, this is how you should spend your money, this is how you should parent, this is how you should, this is the ambitions that you should have for your life. And that's very different from what God says. But when you are on this crossroads, and if you're not in your word, and you're in, many of us are more time, spend more time on Facebook or on TV than on the word of God. Who do you think is discipling you? And my brothers and sisters, the danger thing is, even many of us who call ourselves Christians, we are not so much discipled by Christ as much as a disciple by the world. And that's why God's word warns us, do not be transformed. 
And do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Because the world is trying to conform you. But my brothers and sisters, it matters how you live your life. You will have suffering. And when you suffer, when you are mocked, don't feel like you're a victim. And don't put the victim card. I think many of us Christians do. Because Jesus already said, this is part of what it means to follow me. When you speak up against abortion, you will be shamed. When you speak against what God's design for marriage looks like, or when you share what God's design for marriage looks like, you will be shamed. When you say what it means to follow Christ, you will be shamed. And you might not lose your job. I've seen people who have done that. Who lost their job because they said, I'm going to say no to this. I cannot because this goes against what God tells me. And this is countercultural. And my brothers, be careful that we are not like a fish in the water that we don't even realize how the world is changing us. How our views are more influenced by what our friends and what the media tells us than what God's word tells us. And Jesus goes on, verse 35, for whoever would save his life, my brothers and sisters, I pray that we will pay attention to this and we'll allow God's word to seep in our hearts at the deepest place. He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. Jesus says, in the end, there's only two ways to live. You can try to save your life, and what that means is you can live your life all about your life, your dream, your passions, your desires, your happiness. You can do that. You have that option. You can pursue your own life and not care about what God wants you to do. Not care about God's purpose for your life. Not care what God desires for your life. And you can go the cultural way. And do with your own ambitions. But the, at the end, you can be sure that you will be a loser. And you will know it. Because Jesus says in verse 36, the famous passage, For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeit his own soul? What can man give in return for his own soul? He said, what shall it profit a man if he gave the whole world? But at the end, you lose your soul for all eternity. You live your life apart from God. What does it mean? I mean, think about it. Nobody can gain the whole world, right? But even if you could, Think about if you become the president of the United States with so much power and prestige. Think if you become a multi-billionaire. You can afford anything. But at the end, when you're done, you lose everything. Don't you? Everything. Your prestige goes with it. Your money goes with it. You have everything that we look for. Oh, if I only could have that. You look at a house that's only I have to have my house. Not a bad thing to have a house. If you look at certain things, if only I could get, if only I could make this money, if I only had people thought this of me, we care about what people think of us, right? And we live so much of our lives wanting and trying to people to like us and get approval of that group, never caring what God really thinks about us. Because my brother says, at the end, what matters is not what other people think of you. What at the end, what will matter is what God And what you need to think, and we are so consumed by what other people think of us, and we never care or don't pay attention to what other people think. And Jesus says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? But at the end, you lose your own soul. Septimus Severus, who was a Roman emperor in the second century, died with these words. And he says, I have been everything and everything is nothing. And a little urn will contain all that remains of the one of whom the whole world was to know. He had all the prestige, all the power. 
But he said, all that will remain of me is just some dust. And my brothers and sisters, we can live our life for ourselves. We can pursue everything. We can, people may think highly of us. We may be even honored. But if you do it apart from Christ, I guarantee you, you will crack. I guarantee you, at the end of your life, when you take your last breath, you will say, what a waste. Because you realize at that moment, nothing, nothing goes with you. But here's the wonderful news, my brothers and sisters. Jesus said, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. If you try to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose my life, lose your life for my gospel's sake, you will never be a loser. He said, Jesus said, I will pay you back a hundredfold. Jesus said, anybody has lost their houses, their family, or anything for my sake. Jesus said, I promise you, you will never regret. My brothers and sisters, as I always say, in eternity, tables will be turned. People who are honored may be dishonored if you seek honor apart from God. People who are celebrated will not be celebrated. But people who are considered losers here may not be losers in heaven if they are following Christ, if they lose for the sake of the gospel. You know, when we look at people like Jane Elliot, and say, hey, I kind of feel bad for somebody. From the world's perspective, a young man goes to this place, gets shot. What a waste of life. But my brother says, in God's economy, it's not a waste. Because whoever loses his life will save it. Nothing, my brother and sister, that you do for God, nothing. Nothing that you lose for God, nothing that you do for the king, nothing that you do for the gospel will ever, ever be a loss. Verse 38, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will be the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. He said, if you're ashamed of me now, I'll be ashamed of you when I come in my glory. Right? This makes sense, because we are like that, right? If you're ashamed of your ring, of giving you a marriage ring, you, you're not going on a honeymoon, are you? It's like, hey, I want to go on a honeymoon, but I don't want to now. I'm, I'm kind of ashamed of you. Hopefully, that's not the case. We understand that. Jesus, if you're ashamed of me, if you're ashamed of the gospel, if you're ashamed of calling me master today, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. But if you, and what basically what Jesus is saying, my children, do not be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be a closet Christian. Some of us are closet Christians. Other people don't even know that you're a Christian. You come here, you worship, but that's it. He said, follow me boldly. Serve me enthusiastically. Give for my kingdom generously. Pursue me with all your heart. You will never regret it. But if you live for your own desire, dreams, and ambitions, and follow me, you will regret it. And Jesus says, my brothers and sisters, one day he will come in all his glory with the holy angels. And this is not a fairy tale, this will happen. This time he will not come as a little baby or riding on a donkey. He will come in all his glory. And on that day, you'll be glad you followed him. He will turn all your tears into joy, your loss into eternal gain, your shame into eternal honor. And God puts his seal on this promise. My brothers and sisters, today is a day of decision. If you're not a Christian, or if you're somebody say, maybe, because maybe in the end is what? No. Okay? Because a lot of us are like, yeah, maybe. I, you know, I'm still pursuing, I'm still on the journey. Some of us have been doing this journey for a while. It's good to be on the journey. If you're a seeker, come and talk to us. Know more about Jesus. But you can't be on this journey forever. 
At some point, you have to answer this question, who is Jesus? Because I think a lot of people, yeah, 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 I'm open to it, I'm open to it. But remember, maybe at the end, it's a no. So some of you, you completely say no, and I hope that you will, you will study more. You will come and talk to us. You may have doubts, come and talk, talk to other people. And some of you, maybe, explore God. But I pray that you will surrender your life to Christ. And for those who are Christians, it's not barely getting into heaven. It's asking yourself, am I living a life of disciple? Am I pursuing my own dreams and own life and not care about what God wants for my life? Am I living to pursue my own pleasures? My brothers and sisters, even as believers, we can be so into the world and we lose sight of what God wants. And I pray that not be us. Coming back to our, our heart for this church, we want this place to be filled with people. But we want to be filled with people who are pursuing God. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how successful you are. But at the end of the day, what matters is what God wants to do. Let's close our eyes.